spoiler alert, there's a recession coming. <laughs> Just about everything points there. And you're like, well, I can't really tell you where it's going, but I can tell you how to prepare. You need something that's that you know rock solid is, is going to go up. That's really why I lean toward whole life insurance. Whole life insurance, everything's guaranteed. The premium's guaranteed, the cash value is guaranteed, the death benefit's guaranteed. Everything is guaranteed. The insurance company can't change their mind and come back and ask you for more money. The whole point of everything Tom just explained to you is risk mitigation, is trying to get you to understand the risks and how to eliminate as many of them as possible. Welcome back everybody, another wealth webinar. And today I think is one of the most timely webinars we've ever done. Hey, hey did every one of you see what happened Monday? Just checking. I mean, you know, when the whole world's market crashed. Yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? But it was also a reminder of what you need to be thinking about when it comes to your money. We always say it's time for all of you to learn the truth about money. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But we're not going to just talk about the truth about money. We're not going to just talk about you taking back control of your money. What we're going to really hit on, and I've got an amazing guest, Mr. Tom Wall with us, we are going to hit on creating the calm to the storm. So think about a storm. Imagine being on a boat and you're in the North Sea and just, I don't know, 100 foot swells. Just imagine being on that boat in those swells. Would you be nervous? Would you be shaken? Would you be hiding? Would you be on your hands and knees? Or would you be just super calm, smoking a stogie, just being like, man, this is going to be fun. Woo! Yeah, like Joe Dirt style. We want you to be calm in the storm. And my guest, Tom, is going to bring, we talked about this earlier, an academic approach to being calm in the chaos of the markets. And we definitely can show you how to do that. Tom definitely can. But see, here's the cool thing. Let me just talk a little bit about Tom. <clears throat> I had him on my podcast, but he's got a PhD, but it's not just a normal PhD. He's got a PhD in retirement income. How many of you want a PhD in retirement income? And, you know, retirement income is that check you get every single month, the day when you check out and you retire. Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about. And everything that I know is about to happen with the markets, with the economy, it's going to create some seriously rough seas. You've already seen a small taste of it. Yes, I know it looks like everything's going to be okay because the market's bouncing back, but it's an election year. After the election, I don't know, buckle in, hang on, get ready, turn the windshield wipers on, whatever you got to do. But what we're going to do today is give you a really serious look at how you can be incredibly calm when all the chaos is going on in the markets around you. And we're going to specifically tailor that around three things. So what you're going to learn today is you're going to learn how to create maximum efficiency in your retirement income. Okay, that's number one. We're definitely going to talk about whole life insurance, but we're going to talk about whole life insurance and we're going to tie it into where we're at in the economic cycle and where we're at in the interest rate cycle, which is very interesting in Tom's approach to that. He speaks about this all over the place. He speaks and works with advisors like myself and Stephen and all of our money mentors, but he also wrote a book. Check the title of this book out. I want all of you to check this book out and get a copy of it. It's called Permission to Spend. Let me repeat that. Permission to spend. How many of you like the sound of that? Put that in the chat. How many of you want a hall pass to spend all of your money in retirement, just to live out that bucket list, to literally just go for the gusto and not have a care in the world? You just, you're just gonna, you got the permission slip to spend it all. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, well, that's what that book's all about. And that's some of the things we're gonna hit on. And we're gonna finish up this wealth webinar with what I think is one of the most, well, fun to talk about, but also controversial topics out there. And that is the good old topic of whole life or IUL. So with that being said, folks, let's dive in. Let me introduce our guest, the man of the hour and a half, Mr. Tom Wall. Thanks for having me, Chris. Excited to be here with you all. Yeah, excited to have you on. So Tom, just give everybody, I, I know I saw you out in Colorado at uh, Caleb's event, the And Asset event, which was a peer event, like a bunch of other advisors. <clears throat> and what I heard you talking about when you were on the stage speaking just really captivated me. So just can you just give everybody a quick little bit about your background, what you do? I know you've been in the industry for 21 years, which gives you a little bit of wisdom about how things work. But yeah, just tell them everything else. 
Yeah. So I started in the business 21 years ago, you know, right out of college selling life insurance before quickly moving into, you know, investment management, financial planning, things like that. But only did that for about four years before joining the home office of one of the major mutual carriers where I became very much a product expert, was on stages all around, you know, talking to advisors about the concepts and the strategies and the products. And in the meantime, you know, it was pretty deep in academics, just one class at a time over 15 years. It's amazing how it kind of stacks up. Asking question after question, trying to figure out if what I was saying was actually true, or was it just a good sales pitch with a product that you probably don't have to apologize for? And at the end of the day, I kind of came to the conclusion that I think participating in whole life insurance for a lot of different reasons is probably one of the best kept secrets in personal finance, so much so that I, I actually left my corporate career three years ago to, to go write and finish my PhD, write the book, get on stages uh, to inspire advisors uh, to work with, better with their clients, to help them with the right language and, and, and deliver this. But at the same time, the reason I wrote the book was to give the industry something that they could hand to clients to help them understand why this time-tested 200-year-old uh, product line and strategy still holds up today, uh, regardless of, of what comes comes down the road. I love it. Well, earlier when we were talking offline, <clears throat> I had told you about this event that we've got coming up this Friday. It's a two-day deep dive on a lot of the topics, but one of the topics I'm going to be covering and it, it was all inspired by somebody you actually know extremely well now that I looked at the name. And it was called Integrating Whole Life Insurance into Retirement Income Plan. Can you see that name on the top there? Yes. Wade. So Wade and Michael Fink were the two that did this. So this whole study, this white paper that was done, we're going to be deep diving into this and showing this at the two-day training that we're doing this weekend. And you know, folks, we'll, we'll give you the link for it because this will be one of your last opportunities to grab tickets for this weekend's event. Um, and also, if any of you already have a whole life insurance policy, the cool thing is, is tickets to the event are discounted. They're 47 bucks. If you don't have one, it's 67 bucks. And I've got a little sweetener that anyone that registers today will get. And we'll cover that in a second. But I, did, I didn't want to wait till the end and give you the spoiler alert. I wanted to just get it right out in the open that there's an amazing event going on this weekend. We're going to dive deep into the retirement planning and all the other stuff that goes around what we teach every single day. We'll, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So I want to get to the topic of today's webinar, and that is the calm to the storm. Tom, real quick, can you just tell me a little bit about what you see coming in the markets? Mm -hmm. I mean, Monday was kind of just a, you know, just kind of a, an alert, right? Like the little flag bop popped up and, you know, you got a message and that message is get ready. What are your thoughts as to where we're at and what's coming? You know, I, who knows? It's, you, you never know what's coming down the road. What I do know is that everything is cyclical. And things have been very good for a very long time. And yes, mortgage rates are a little bit higher now than they have been. But overall, the economy has been stable. The economy has been good. Employment's been full. Rates have been low. So leverage has been easy. But all it takes is some geopolitical events to knock that off its axis and, and turn things on its head. Over long periods of time, you know, maybe that's okay. But a big part of the work that I do, and I think what we're about to talk about today, is, is you can't really predict what's coming or when it's coming, but you can absolutely prepare for it so that it doesn't completely derail your plans. I like that. I tend to just kind of go right for the throat and be like, hey, folks, spoiler alert, there's a recession coming. <laughs> just about everything points there. And you're like, well, I can't really tell you where it's going, but I can tell you how to prepare. And really, I think that's what everybody cares about. So let's dive in. Let's talk about the age old. I don't know if it's age old or when it actually started, but you know, as an advisor, I was always told a retirement portfolio should be drawn down at a rate of 4%. And it's actually got the the name of the 4% rule. Can we talk and put a little context to the 4% rule? And does that still hold true today? Because I've heard that it's actually more like the 2% rule today. And if it's the 4% rule, like how good is that? I mean, are, are people really going to feel comfortable if that's all they can take out of their retirement? What's crazy is, so this, I got really fascinated about this early on in my career. It's, it's not actually a rule. What it was is a financial advisor in 1994, looking at a historical data set that went back to the early 1900s. And basically said, if you had a 50-50 portfolio, how much could you start taking from it as a percentage, a percentage of that portfolio in year one, such that it would last for 30 years with actual inflation adjustments to that income based on what the CPI did? So 
you know, in all different periods of time, there was a number of different rates. 1926 is where his data set started. It was 7% in that year. You know, just a couple of years later, it was four and a half. Then it was up to eight and just a couple of years after that. So it was really jumping all over the place. But the worst case scenario in that roughly 100 year period of time was 19, nine, or 1966. At that period of time, you were in the 70s. There was stagflation. You know, inflation was going crazy. The market wasn't moving a whole lot. There was a big crash in 73, 74. So the 4% rule wasn't meant to be a rule. It was just the worst studied period during that period of time. And the funny thing is, is at that point in time, 4% w- would have carried you 30 years, but not even a generation later in 1982, it was, it was almost 11% that you could take from your portfolio and still have it last over the course of a 30 year period of time. So timing is everything. And the problem is we don't know who we are or what we are moving forward. I think where that two and 3% number comes from is because of the low rate environment. You know, if you can't earn anything on your safe money and you need, you know, safe money in retirement, it can really you know, be a problem for, for potential outcomes going forward, especially as people live longer and longer. Well, a lot of people associate safe money with a lack of liquidity. So I think that's one big thing. You know, if we're going to be talking about where do we put our safe money, you know, liquidity has got to be a major factor to that. Because if I go safe with my money, but then all of a sudden I get opportunities to invest that money at a lower price, you know, buy low and then you should be selling high, but invest at a lower price, like you got to have the liquidity. So what are some of the places where we can tackle liquidity and, and at the same time, have the safety because, I mean, a CD is going to lock it up for a certain amount of time. So when I think safety, I think CDs, bank accounts up to 250000 but they don't really pay. I think maybe, you know, some annuities, which I think we can get into. And obviously, you know, save the best for last. I always think about whole life insurance. Yeah, I mean, we think whole life insurance actually performs really well over a long period of time. And it doesn't have to be that long before you start to see that performance. I think you know it, it will give you bond-like returns over long periods of time because these participating whole life policies are backed by giant bond portfolios of these major mutual companies. So it's reasonable to expect you'll get that over time. But the the, the trick is you can actually get access to your capital, but you know without tax disadvantages if you set it up the right way at any time. So there are there are some small rules attached, but you have, you know, I wouldn't and liquidity isn't a term that the that the you know industry likes because you are gonna sacrifice death benefit or something like that. But you can access your money and typically the companies will get you a check in your hands within the week or overnight it to you for a small fee. So it's it's pretty accessible. And that's really why I use use it for almost all of my safe or safe money or accessible cash. Well, well, let's dive right in. I, I got this up on the board. I was just trying to think when we were talking earlier. What do I put on the board, like the calm to the storm? And I just sort of wrote a couple of things. I, I showed the short-term debt cycle, which is every five to seven years. The long-term debt cycle, which is the big move. This is all that Ray Dalio stuff he did and how the economic machine works. And you know, just kind of taking all of this, if X marks the spot, we're somewhere around here right now. And we want to try to protect it because one of the worst things that can happen, and this is the thing that I often talk about, a lot of people have retired somewhere let's just say somewhere in this realm right here, right? They retired and now they're taking income from some type of a retirement portfolio, a 401k, 403b. But as we start to go down in the market, we still have to take income along the way. So every single month, you got to live. Your social security check's probably not going to cover it. Maybe the pension check gives you a little bit, but if you're taking income out of investment portfolio, like what is this going to do for your future? I mean, it, it like in an academic way, I mean, like, how do you, in yeah. the old way, and then with what we're going to talk about, how do you combat that? Because you got to live, so you got to take income, but how do you do it the most efficient way? It's a great question. Honestly, when, what you're talking about, market volatility is probably the biggest risk in retirement. Obviously, inflation can be a big one, but the, the other thing that dictates those safe withdrawal rates is, is the subsequent market returns that you get. And on the way up, you know, in the accumulation phase on your way to retirement, market volatility can be your friend. You know, if the market goes down 20%, well, guess what? Stocks are on sale by 20%. You get to buy them cheaper than everybody than you used to be able to. And that's okay if you're, you know, systematically putting money in. On the way out, though, the math works against you. And I'll put it this way. If imagine you have $100 and then you lose 25%, you know, what do you have? 75 bucks, right? Well, what do you need to earn as a return to catch up and get back to 100? It's not 25%. You now need to earn 33% to catch up. Add to that, if on top of that 25% loss, you take income and turn it into a 30, 35, 40% loss, if you will, in value for the portfolio, 
it becomes pretty darn hard, if not impossible, to catch up. And it's called sequence of returns risk. This is the biggest thing that retirees deal with if all they've done is just amassed wealth in a volatile investment portfolio. And, and in those portfolios, you know, there are so and so called safer allocations, but they all carry risk. They all carry risk and, and history is no no guarantee of what comes down the road. Real quick, I just want to see what the audience looks like here. So folks, we got 113 of you on. How many of you are right now retired or looking to retire in the next year? Put I in the chat. I just want to make sure I'm giving you the info that you need and want. So we got Pam, we got James, John, Terrace, Robert. Wow. Holy cow. All right. Christine, Jerry, Deborah. Oh my gosh, it just keeps going. Martha. Whoa. You can, you're, you're all just sick of it. You're just, you're just done. Some of you watch that movie Bucket List and you're just like, yep, it's time. James says, close, but never really fully retire. That's how I feel, James. I'll never fully retire. All right, so there's a bunch of you. Now, real quick, and we can we can go to three years. That's fine. Look next three years. What is the biggest fear all of you have that are either retired or looking to retire? Like, what's the biggest thing that keeps you up at night or that, you know, you get the sweaty palms when thinking about retiring or thinking about what retirement is going to look like for the next 20 years? Running out of money. I knew that was going to be a retirement is made up. Not enough money, won't last. Civil war, inflation. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that would be a bad one. Although Ray Dalio does say we got a one in three chance of a civil war, but it won't be a civil war of taking arms. It'll be a civil war of just moving to the state that best suits your, your likings, your political beliefs and everything else. All right, so let's just hit on some of these. Tom, you can see these chats coming in, right? I can. No, that was an interesting one from James. No money to pass on. Investments yeah. fail. Market a lot of market volatility and a lot of running out of money, and then a couple government taking it all. I wouldn't rule that one out. Back pain. <laughs> What's up, Peter? Peter, you probably know a guy that can fix back pain, though. I I bet you any money. All right. So, so we got them all. The only one I don't think we can solve for today, and what we're going to teach you is the back pain part. Although Motrin will take care of it temporarily. So. Where do you, what one of those do you think is the one you want to hit on first? A lot of them are the same, you know, outliving your money, running out of money. It's just, all I see there is just a list of risks. And that's the issue with retirement income planning when, when it's on you versus, you know, the history where people relied on pensions and companies and, and a 30 year career to take care of them in retirement. You know, everyone's on their own now for the most part. Uh, even folks that still have pensions, that's only a portion of, of what they're doing for retirement. They're still very much on their own with their other investments. But I mean, come on, four hundred one k's were supposed to be the Almighty. They were supposed to be the answer to everything. Even the hey, even the person who invented it and wrote the book five hundred one k said something different. Yeah, it was meant to be like this executive car. It was never meant to be the the retirement structure for the United States. It was meant to be a, a small carve out in the in the code, but turned into a much bigger thing than that. Absolutely, it turned into as Tess would say, one of the greatest scams. Yeah, so security's right up there with that. So so let's hit running out of money. How do we solve for running out of money using whole life insurance of all places? And I also would love to layer in a thing called annuities because annuities, I think it's kind of like a double punch. You know, it's kind of like you got whole life insurance and you got annuities. In some realms, and I know you work in the the advisor and agent space, so you probably don't hear it as much, but we get a lot of haters on our social channels. So if I put whole life in a in a post instantly haters come out. If I put annuities, I get haters too. So they're like the two black eyes in the industry when you say the name, but I kind of just love putting it out there. So let's talk about how those two vehicles and what you've done with your studies, how they play into a really efficient retirement strategy and one that can solve some of those problems we discussed. Yeah. I mean, calling an entire category a bad deal is like saying cars are bad. Like there are better and, and, and worse versions of, of cars and you probably want to own a certain kind. The truth is the most efficient way to retire and spend down money over the course of your life based on actuarial science and what, what you can expect to see in your future is to annuitize your assets. You know, if an annuity it, it, at its core, forget about all of the variations you can you can invest in, all the riders you can buy. And, and I may agree some of those are not the, the best use of your dollars, but just a pure income annuity that is designed to turn a, a pool of capital into an income stream that you can't outlive is creating your own private pension. That's what a pension is. A pension basically, you know, they they manage money on behalf of millions of participants. And because when you have the law of large numbers on your side, they know exactly how, how long people are going to live and therefore can give them income that they cannot live. 
So for an individual, you know, there's something, there's actually something called in academics, the, the annuity puzzle. You know, the academics can't figure out why more people don't annuitize their assets and turn their 401ks or investments into a personal pension because it is so efficient and it is so perfectly aligned with how long they probably will live and what the risks are. But the big two reasons are if you took a million bucks and gave it to an insurance company at 65 years old, maybe they'll give you $70,000, maybe $75,000 per year, which is a way more than a 4% withdrawal rate. That's like a 7.5% cash flow rate to start. And you cannot live it. It'll pay out 60 years from now, even if you live that long. But what you trade is you trade some liquidity, right? You can't really get access to that million dollars anymore. And I'll say that's perceived liquidity because even in a 401k or a systematic withdrawal program, like if you start invading principal, you're jeopardizing your retirement. So it's, it's not real liquidity there. But the other big one is that if you live a while, which is the most likely event of all, you don't leave anything behind. There's no legacy to the next generation. And I have found that most people love other people. You know, Whether or not you want to make your kids millionaires and leave that kind of legacy, you're at the very least obligated to make sure that your spouse is taken care of. So, or, or, you, or at least you feel you have that obligation legally from your 401k, you do have that obligation that they have to sign off on. But that is the most efficient way. So why I'm such a fan of whole life insurance is it's the only product, it's the only permanent life insurance product that has a guaranteed cash value built in with upside. So you 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 have that liquid pool of funds that you can tap into if you needed to, but it also has a death benefit far above and beyond those cash values that kind of pegs the legacy for the next generation. So that's how I view it in my retirement plan. You know, when I <clears throat> when I save and invest, I have every expectation that I will be annuitizing or aggressively spending down my assets. Because I know my kids are going to be taken care of, my spouse is going to be taken care of, uh, and I've got some other insurances in place to, to shift those risks to somebody else. Instead of, if you think about it, if you're underspending in retirement, which a lot of retirees are, and they're only spending 2 or 3 or 4% of that portfolio, they're effectively acting like their own insurance company. They're just hoarding capital just in case some relatively unlikely things happen. Uh, and it's really a tragedy. It's it's why I wrote the book. It's it's that it's the puzzle of retirement income planning. Love that. All right, <clears throat> let's take this on to the next one. But actually, before I do that, folks, like I, hopefully everyone, I wrote it down. Hopefully everybody picked up on that seven and a, roughly around seven seven and a half percent. I believe that's what you said, Tom. Right? Give or take. I know there's some variables in there, but I'm just trying to over seven percent. We'll say that. Yeah, that's Guaranteed. what it was. That was that's what it was a month or two ago for a 65 year old male. So 65-year-old male, over 7% on your money guaranteed. That's Anyone correct. like the sound of that? Like, what if, what if all you did, folks, is you just took the money in your retirement account and you just moved a portion of that money so that it covered your basic household expenses? So, like, no matter what happened, at least you never got kicked out of your house, you had food on the table, and all the basic household things were taken care of. Would that be okay if you gave up some liquidity on money to get a seven plus percent guaranteed return for the rest of your life. You'd never, ever have to worry about that money moving at all. It'd be the same thing. You could even index it for inflation if you wanted. And that money just comes in and all your basic expenses are taken care of. So now it takes pressure off your portfolio so your portfolio can continue to grow and you're not always drawing it down just for basic expenses. Well, just, to go... clarify. Go ahead. Just, just to clarify, just to clarify that so people understand. So that 7% is the cash flow off the annuity. So if you if you basically give an insurance company a million bucks, they'll give you $70,000 as long as you live. So it's not necessarily the rate of return, if you will. It's the cash, it's the initial cash flow off the annuity that you can't outlive. So what's what's funny about it is, you know, once once you break even, which is probably 12 or 13 years out, you know, that you actually get your money back on that kind of cash flow. After that, your 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 internal rate of return, your your actual rate of return lifetime gets higher and higher and higher as those payments continue to come and you live longer. So I think it's important. It's an important distinction that some people say, yeah, you get a 7% return. It's not really a 7% return. It's a 7% initial cash flow versus starting with like a the 4% rule, like a 4% initial withdrawal rate and then inflating it. Love it. All right. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk a little bit about putting some liquidity back since we're going to take some liquidity, you know, with, with that income annuity option to guarantee those base, basic expenses. So what else can people use for the liquidity? We talked about whole life, but a lot of people, when they think of whole life, they think death benefit, they don't think cash flow, they don't think retirement planning. So how do we have that discussion about where, you know, per, I'm, I'm going to say specially designed whole life 
from a participating life insurance company that pays dividends, just so that I get it out there right, because this is not every whole life insurance policy and not every insurance company does this. We're talking about specific, specially designed whole lives. So yeah, take it from there. There's a lot of options. I mean, there's there's fixed annuities, there's there's indexed annuities. These are all pretty conservative designs. You know, you get some you get some tax advantages in those. And you, and you typically get a, a pretty reasonable return relative to what you can do with cash or, or more liquid vehicles. You know, home equity is one of the most overlooked assets in people's portfolios. The, the typical American, their two biggest assets are their home equity and their 401k. And, you know, reverse mortgages and, th and planning like that is not what it used to be. You know, there are actually some pretty decent, there has been a lot of regulations around that over the last uh, couple decades. And there's actually some pretty good, pretty good strategies to use that as kind of a buffer for volatility in, in, re in retirement. As a, the thought process is often, you know, for folks is whatever, I'm just going to pay down my mortgage. I'm just going to hold assets inside of my house and I'll pass it to my kids. But the kids rarely want the house. You know, what happens is they, they end up just selling the house, unless it's an amazing beach property or something like that. The kids are just going to sell it. So there may be more efficient uses for your lifetime of, of those that home equity. But nothing is more efficient or clean in terms of transferring assets than just a pure death benefit where the check passes right outside of probate to your to your family. Well, that, yeah, right. So let's let's go that route because it, it's, I think, perfectly in line with your book. So permission to spend, like, can, can we just, we'll put a pin in what we were just talking about. We'll come back to that. Let's talk about how do you, like, what's, what's your book permission to spend all about? When you get to retirement, you will be terrified to spend. So right now there's an epidemic among retirees where they are hoarding their capital because they're terrified of what happens if they live too long. They're, they're, they're afraid of a major market crash. They're afraid of what happens if they require expensive ongoing medical care that their health insurance doesn't cover that could be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars of value. You know, people are living longer. There is geopolitical risk. You know, we World War III could break out. There's so many things that could happen that people are terrified to spend their money because it's they can't go back and go back to work in many cases, or at least you can't make that assumption because as you age, your health typically declines. So that's the issue is, you know, people are afraid to spend. So what, what permission to spend is all about is how do we, you know, maybe, maybe you can't take every risk off the table, but how do we peg a value for the, for the next generation, make sure that there is a legacy in place, make sure that there is capital, whether it's all on whole life cash value or not, doesn't matter, but there is enough capital for that liquidity. And if we can take those concerns off the table, the big ones, then people are going to feel far more comfortable to annuitize, to spend their assets and enjoy what they took decades, you know, an entire working life to accumulate versus hoarding that and then and then dying with it in probably the most inefficient tax vehicle to pass assets that you can, which, which is your 401k. So one thing I hope all of you were picking up, sorry, I was just taking a sip of water on that is, you know, there's so many people, and, and I saw it in the comments, there's so many people that save their entire life, they get this huge nest egg, which is earmarked for retirement so they can live their perfect life. Then all of a sudden they get to that time and you know, when they're taking the money or figuring out whether whether they should do this thing, buy this car, go on this vacation, do whatever's on their bucket list, they're like, oh, yeah, but if I do this, there won't be any money to leave to the kids, you know, or if I die too early, my my wife or husband won't have any money to live on and I'll leave them. So they, they what was the terminology, the, the uh, epidemic, I think you called it? the epidemic continues where people are scared to spend money. Then all the other fears that you mentioned, running out and all those things come up. But what if what if running out of money was okay? Okay, well, you don't want to run out of money too soon, but what if spending all almost all of your money was okay? Because now you had a vehicle in place that made sure that your family and all your money was regenerated the day you're gone. That would That would solve that problem. And that's basically the permission to spend, the whole model behind that. So like what what is everybody's thought has anyone given thought to that because I know if anyone is is buying into the buy term invest the difference you are absolutely not thinking like that. So one of the things we talked about earlier, you know, we were talking about the retirement, how to make it more efficient, but having a PhD in retirement income like what are what is what's involved in that? Like can we just talk a little bit about like what was that like getting a PhD because it's it's a very specialized type of thing that you did. And and it was just, I, I was blown away when I saw the person that did this white paper was 
would I say your mentor or whatever it would be, but Wade? Yeah, he was my dissertation advisor. My 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 dissertation was on, you know, whole life as a fixed income alternative in retirement, trying to prove, you know, whether or not it actually made sense as a fixed income or bond alternative. But, you know, the program is is pretty real. I've never worked harder in my life academically. I've, I've gotten a lot of credentials, but that one was pretty tough. But it was all about how people age, some of the issues that they face, talk a lot about long-term care. A lot of studies in in the actual distribution of assets, you know, and and we're talking about some of the market cycles we were just talking about, and the risks that are inherent in pulling money out of volatile portfolios. Um, we, we we did a lot of studies of historical retirements, which, by the way, were far shorter as life expectancies were shorter, but typically were far more based on defined contributions, where you worked for a company for a long long time, and you had a pension, and and you were taken care of in that way, which a lot of folks are not today. So like I, like we started with, it's, you know, retirement income planning is really just solving a big puzzle. It's easy to just amass a bunch of assets and then spend a very little of it and then just hoard that capital the rest of your life. But that's kind of pathetic. That's not what you did it for. You know, the, you have the ability, if you plan properly, with, if you begin with the end in mind, to pull that spending forward into your healthiest years in your 60s and 70s, hypothetically, and enjoy it. <clears throat> which is what you're, which is the stated goal of all that saving. All right. I'm a guy, I can't do two things at once. I was just trying to get a quick question answered in there. All right. This, this right behind me. So let's just talk about it, about whole life as a, a fixed income alternative. So you're familiar with this, right? What we're looking at here. All right. So I talk about this all the time, the inverse relationship between interest rates and also bond prices. So specifically, I talk about treasury bonds often, but it would be the same for any long-term bond and how they react. So here are some, some facts and some things that happen. This, this slide's a little old, so bear with it. But we know for a fact that over the last couple of years, the Fed has raised interest rates. And in raising interest rates, what it has done is drove the price of bonds down, down quite a bit. I, I mean, to say that you can buy bonds low or could buy bonds really low was was pretty much an understatement. Would you agree with that, Tom? Like when the interest rates went up that quick? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So if we all want to buy investments at their lowest point, well, now is the opportunity. But we know that the Fed has already kind of come out and there's been a lot of pressure, even people asking the Fed to do emergency rate cuts because of a one day crash in the markets, which blew my mind. But when interest rates do come down, which I would say, and I can't tell you this is for sure, but if I was to guess, September will be one of the first rate drops by the Fed. And what that will do is when interest rates come down, the price of the bond goes up. So this is a huge risk. And it's one of the main risks we talk about when we talk about bonds is we have this unknown risk that comes along with interest rates and inflation and everything else. Because if interest rates go up again, our bond prices are going to go down. So if you were retiring and you had, let's just say one of those freedom date funds in your 401k, 403b, and it was heavily allocated to bonds, long-term bonds like treasuries. And then all of a sudden, and that's what they do, folks. They they shift the portfolio to be heavier weighted in, in fixed income assets like mutual funds that hold bonds like treasuries. And as that happened, if interest rates were to have gone up, and you were to retire, you'd be retiring and drawing from your safe part of your portfolio at a really low price. I mean, let's not forget what happened to Silicon Valley Bank and, and some of the others, Republic Bank, and they all, fa they were faced with this. They had a run on the bank, their bonds were in the tank from a price standpoint, but they had nowhere else to go. They had to sell their bonds. And when they did, that was it. So this is a great maybe buying opportunity right now if you were to buy them. But if you were retired already and you were in bonds, this is a terrible scenario if you've been drawing income out of this. So is this what you're talking about when you mention whole life as an alternative to fixed income to reduce the risks? Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, we've we've been lulled to sleep. The interest rates have been falling since 1981. So yes, they've come up a little bit in the last couple of years. And that's why you started to see the bond volatility. But you know the smart the smart fixed income investors have been calling the bond bubble for forever as interest rates just got lower and lower and lower. So you know the typical 60 40 portfolio of, of 60 percent stocks and 40 percent bonds and retirement has looked really good if you look at it, especially over the last you know 40 to 50 years. It's looked fantastic as bonds have been the perfect diversifier for for equities while bonds lost value only about 
you know, once out of every six years or so. Uh, and when it and when it did lose value, it was it was very small. But everyone just saw in 2022 the risk that's inherent in a rising interest rate environment where you can lose a whole bunch of money real fast. And that's the that's the issue going forward. Is is yes, rates can come back down, and that's going to be good for bonds for a year, for two, for three. I don't know. But there is a theoretical lower bound, which we just bounced off of, which is that you know one percent ten year treasury and then all those those all time low rates. And if we get back to there, we just start from square one again with huge risks in bonds. The reason whole life insurance works so well is because the insurance company gathers assets, you know, tens of billions of dollars per year in, in new and renewal pre premium payments from investors, and they're and they're sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars in their general investment accounts basically backing those liabilities that they're putting on the books in terms of death benefits and cash values. And they invest very conservatively, typically in the long end of the yield curve <clears throat> with uh, 10, 20 year duration, long-term corporate bonds. And the difference there is they don't really suffer that volatility risk because they're just holding these bonds until maturity. They're going to collect interest off these bonds for 10 or 20 years. And then at the end of the day, get their money back. So they don't really have the need to sell those bonds like an individual investor would to raise money to to live on. So what you get in a whole life plan is basically you're getting guaranteed cash values that must go up every year. The only question is how fast. And that question of how fast is basically how much do they enhance those guarantees based on the cash flow they're getting off of their general investment account. So in those terms, and this is actually what my dissertation was in, was does that actually provide a better, if not return, risk adjusted return to the, to the investor? And it did. That was essentially what the results were is, is over longer periods of time, if you can kind of get into it and hold on to it for a while, you're going to get bond-like returns. But the big thing is that you're going to have a lot less risk and volatility. And that's what they're paying the multi-million dollar salaries on Wall Street to figure out. It's the sharp ratio. It's the risk-adjusted return. It's how do we, for a given level of risk, get outsized returns? You don't actually get that with whole life. You're going to get a bond-like return. Or how do we, for the same level of return, minimize the risk? And if we can do that with a portion of our portfolio, then maybe the 60-40 portfolio could be 65-35 or 70-30, both think, you know, thought about globally. And every study ever done has shown if you can have more exposure to the market and stay in the market longer and have, have more exposure to it right before and right after retirement, you on average will have better outcomes. But you can only do that if you have something that is not exposed to market risk. Love it. Well, let's, <clears throat> let's take a break and just hit a couple of questions. Folks, if any of you have questions, maybe even a personal question, you can put it in the Q&A. We can answer it privately or we can answer it publicly. But I want to go to Peter. What's going on, Peter? He had a question and it's all to the whole life side. So he's saying he has whole life policies, specially designed whole lives, and he's deploying his cash from the cash value into different investments, things like hard money lending, syndications, and investments. So when we think of whole life, one of the things that is is often not talked about is, you know, a lot of times we're just talking about whole life. And, and I know in that study, you're just putting the premium dollars into the whole life, letting it grow, and then using it, you know, when the market goes down as a volatility buffer and using it for the death benefit. So essentially, it's kind of acting as just a, a side pool of funds. But there's a lot of people like what Peter's mentioning here that are actually using the cash value during the years that they're accumulating, and they're using the cash value to go out and make more money. Some people are using it to pay off debt, invest, lend, things like that. Like, what would that do to an overall like retirement strategy or portfolio? Do you think it'd make a big difference or a minor difference? What's your take on that? Well, I think it's about, again, it's about having an asset that always goes up. So during the working years, I've, I've, I've heard countless stories, you know, it was, you know, right during COVID, I have, I have a friend who borrowed a hundred thousand dollars out of his whole life policy, literally the day, the day after the bottom and man, did he make a ton of money at when he, when he, when he did that investment uh, and he's been, he's paid that loan back. So, it, so that's exactly what it fits. It's almost like it's a cash allocation for opportunistic things, you know, during, on, in the accumulation phase. The caution I would say is for a retiree to be doing that. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's definitely adding more risk. The key to the, the key to the strategy is to always have something that's going up. So, you know, whether it's stocks and bonds, cash, whole life, real estate, you should buy low and sell high. It's just basic investing. So you want to make sure that you always have at least a, a significant portion of your allocation, at least one to three years, maybe, maybe more if you're more conservative, that is always going up in value. And if you have all those alternative investments, you know, many of those have no guarantees of that. And during a true meltdown, like if there's, we haven't seen one in a very long time, and that includes, you know, the last 20 years, those were not real, 
you know, calamities like the Great Depression. Like if something massive like that happens, World War III breaks out, everything goes down. So you need something that you need, you need something that's that you know rock solid is, is going to go up. Totally off topic, but seeing as though like we're, we're in some interesting times with what's going on in, with Iran and in Israel. If we did enter World War III, do you think any of us would even be here anymore? Depends. Depends I mean, it scares the hell out of me. It's the reason I had to ask yeah. you. Sometimes I feel like I'm on an island, like thinking about this, like, holy crap, like, would, would that be the end? I mean, I don't know. Scary thought. Hypothetically, hypothetically, it would be the end from the story that I've heard. I just I just hope the bomb hits close to me. And so I don't Good suffer. Point. Good point. And will the life insurance companies still pay out the death benefits to the people that are still around? That's a that's a kind of a yeah. silly question but the answer would be yes just like they have every other single time like that's the unique thing is, is just like no matter what other time world war ii and all the other times whole life insurance has been around they've always paid out and they've always continued to grow and and, and the funniest thing is the dividend the one thing that like all the the haters out there always hit on all the dividends aren't guaranteed do you know of any time <clears throat> in history where the majors let's just say the top five mutually owned life insurance carriers have not paid a dividend do you know of any that missed the dividend i don't, I don't know of any. yeah i don't know of a all single the, one that ever missed no all the major ones have been around since the mid to late 1800s and they've they've all paid every year so yes it's it's not guaranteed they could stop but that's the whole business model you know and that's why mutuality and participation makes so much sense is you know they operate for the benefit of their policy owners. There are no shareholders, you know, to take to take profitability. So if they, after they make their investments and after they, you know, pay their employees and, and cover their costs, everything that's left gets distributed to the policy owners. You know, that's really, that's really the value prop. They're operating on your, on your behalf versus operating to maximize shareholder value and then maybe pay you a few extra bucks to make you happy. That's why a lot of the big, you know, stock-based companies that had really good whole life products, you know, exited the business eventually because of the pressure from shareholders that you don't see in the major mutuals. And I think that's one thing I say it a lot. And sometimes I just think that everybody knows, but with 111 people, I got to believe there's a couple of people on here that don't understand the, the true meaning of mutual. So when you buy a whole life policy from a mutually owned carrier, you're essentially you're like an owner in a roundabout way. Can, you probably have a much better way of explaining that. So can you explain the difference between mutually owned versus stock? Yeah, I mean, as well, a stock-based company is just like any other company. You know, you own, a, you own, if you own one share, you own one one millionth of the company or however many shares are out there. And you will receive, and if they're paying a dividend, like if you own Apple stock, you get your quarterly dividend. You know, they're, they basically pay that back based on the amount of shares that you own. In a mutual ownership, you don't technically own the company. So when, when you own oh, a life insurance policy, the, the technical terminology that they will use is that the company operates for the benefit of its policy owners. And the reason we don't say you own part of the company is because you couldn't sell someone your policy and give them ownership in the company, if you will, that you don't actually own a piece of the company. So it's a holding company. But their board of directors is organized and their charter is to operate for the benefit of their policy owners. There's there's nowhere else for the money to go. Like they can buy buildings, they can acquire companies, they can they can you know, pay their executives more. But at the end of the day, there's so much money coming in. You know, it's, it's, it's goes back out to the policy owner and that's how they compete. That's how they win new businesses by keeping a, a high dividend. Uh, so that's, that's the structure is, is they're essentially sitting on the same side of the table as you. And I've been behind the curtain talking to actuaries, you know, as they're building product sets and they're very careful about building these product sets so that they don't hurt prior policy owners that bought policies 20 years ago with new pricing or new, new aggressiveness. It's, it's, it was actually pretty amazing to watch that thought process and, and actually see behind the scenes that they actually are operating for the benefit of, of you, the policy owner. It's, it's, it's a huge difference. I, hopefully everyone understands the importance of that, you know, sitting on the same side of the table, you know, a, a stock company, well, I mean, gosh, you could look at so many of them. I mean, Matt and, you know, call off a bunch of them. I mean, like, it's just different when they're not mutual anymore. Uh, one question that came in, I like this one. Andy, Andy D said, if participating in the alternative investments, can whole life cash value be used to qualify for accredited investor status by net worth? So I've never been asked that. I thought that was a good question. Do you know the answer to that? So essentially, can yeah, cash you, in a whole life be used to get accredited investor status? I've never been asked that question either, but I can't imagine why it wouldn't be. It's an asset on yeah. your balance sheet just like anything else. That's a good question. And, and Andy, it's rare that somebody asks a question we've never heard. I've never heard that one. Steven, you ever hear that one? I have not, no. That's kind of good, but yeah. I, I know when banks, for example, when banks qualify you, I mean, they'll look at 
cash value, you know, banks understand it. So I'm sure if you have the right accountant, they understand, like you said, Tom, it's an asset on your, on your sheet. So I'm sure it would apply towards net worth. Yeah. I, I would assume it does. Uh, James Kirk said, are there tax ramifications of annuity payments? That's a pretty easy one. Do you want to hit that one or you want me to? Well, it all depends, but yes, a portion of your annuity payment would be taxable as a gain. It's it's called the exclusion ratio based on your life expectancy. If your money is coming out of a qualified plan like your 401k, it's all taxable. But in terms of ramifications, no, I mean, no, there's no penalties or anything like that that would come from annuitization of your assets. It's just going to you're going to fractionally recognize, you know, the, the implied gain. Gosh, I'm glad you answered that one. That was way better than I would have answered. All right. Now let's move into the final round here in this wealth webinar. And I saved, I don't know about it, saving the best for last, but the most controversial for last. And I'm going to hit it off with Sherman's question. I have an IUL. Is that the same as whole life? You know, what's funny, you know, you and I were talking earlier and you asked you, why do you think whole life gets such a bad name? And with when I hear that question, it dawns on me that a lot of people just use the term whole life for the entire category of permanent life insurance, which includes traditional universal life, variable universal life, indexed universal life. So they think they own whole life insurance, but they actually own a product that doesn't give them any guarantees and is, and is fraught with risk. So no, you don't own whole life insurance. If it's called indexed universal life, that's a, it's a whole different product suite. But let's dive into it. So there is a lot of controversy out there. And and I battle this one head on. And I think everybody that's on this wealth webinar that's seen me before, you know how my answers always go with IUL. But like now we're kind of taking more of an academic look at IUL and whole life. And and Tom, when you did your speech, like this is the part that just blew my mind, the way that you explained this, the way that you talked about each one. And, and just the other day, and I'm not going to use his name, but you know somebody I know very well, he's a life insurance guy here works for one of those companies that does a lot of the buy term invested difference. I think you all know the name of the company starts with a P, but he, in a post put, I, I can't remember what it was, but he essentially did what you just described, Tom, is he, he said whole life. And I'm like, whoa, why, why is he saying whole? Cause I know what he does. Right. And then he said, I, U, L and he slashed like whole life slash I, U, L. And I knew what he was doing. He was literally insinuating that they both do the same thing. And he was he was pretty much putting them in the same context. And I'm not going to get into what he, you know, what his his whole methodology behind that is. But he is, and I've gotten in good debates with him because I'm a friend with him, but in big debates about buy term invested difference. And and no matter what, he will swear that that's always the best option for every everything. So it surprised me when I saw Whole Life and IUL in his in his in his post on Instagram. But when we talk about these two, whole life's been around for a very long period of time. IULs are relatively new in the grand scheme of product creation. I mean, IULs spawned from back in the 80s when universal life came out. I mean, whole life was the almighty for, for gosh, I don't even, what, 100, over 100 years probably, whole life was, was the thing. And it was very, like, folks, if any of you have grandparents, they they only most of the time know a whole life. That's just what they grew up with. And they grew up with a really good opinion of whole life. And then who was the guy that, oh God, he was the same guy that did something with the car company. What was his name that I just read about this? Do you, do you know who I'm talking about? He, he like, he kind of pushed down on whole life because he said that the returns that they're getting in the whole life wasn't enough to keep pace with inflation. So then, then the universal life was born. He's like a household name. I can't think of his name. Anyone, anyone know the name? I can't think of the name. Gosh, it's killing me. It'll come to me because as soon as they say it, everybody's going to know. But anyway, I think he was the guy that like also called out Pinto or something like that. But anyway, so Universal Life came out. And back then, if any of you, you know, were around in, in that period of time, we were in a very heightened interest rate environment, a crazy interest rate environment. So Universal Life made a ton of sense because you, you'd buy this product. OK, it was designed to basically grow with interest rates and you could illustrate it at the current interest rate with a floor. So I think the floor back then was even three percent. And the thing illustrated like like beautifully, I mean, too beautifully. And then as interest rate markets changed and interest rates started going down, which we went through about a 30 year period of declining interest rates, actually a little over 30 years. During that period of time, let me tell you exactly what happened from a front row seat. So I was an advisor in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, one of the, the luxuries I had is I, I was given by my general agency a stack of these universal life policies, and they were called Target Life. 
Okay, so I'm not going to get into what that meant, but they were target life. And basically what you knew when you got this stack is that every one of these universal life policies that were all bought in either the 80s or early 90s, they were all going to fail. They were all going to lapse. And most of them were going to lapse within five years. My job was to call a client, say, hey, I'd like to come out and have a review of your policy. It's been a long time, and there are some changes that have happened with your policy that are, require immediate attention. Can I come see you? I'd drive out there. And the discussion was the same thing every time. Here's your illustration for the policy. Here's how it looks. As you can see, your cost of insurance is more than the growth of the interest rate or the interest that the policy is accumulating at. So therefore, your policy will lapse in three years or whatever it was. So that's like Greek to some of these folks because they, they bought a policy way back when and they were told this thing's going to be around for 100 years and it's going to grow and it's going to have all this money in it. Now here I am sitting there showing them that their policy that they thought was never going to change, that thought was going to just be in the most amazing thing is going to go away in three years. And they had a couple options. You can let it lapse, which means your life insurance coverage is gone. Option number two, you can put in the required premium every year to just barely keep this thing alive, which usually was more than double what they were used to paying. Option number three, we can 1035 exchange or move this policy's values into a new whole life insurance policy where the policy will not have any issues. However, the premium is going to be more than what you're paying. Those are the three options. Can you imagine being in that position? I got used to it. So it was just kind of like, I got, you know, swore at, I got people crying in some cases. It was a terrible thing, but this was a universal life policy. That was the all, all to do, the one that was talked about, that one that all the brokers and agents were selling. And then came VULs, variable universal life, where now all of a sudden you take buy term, invest the difference, but hey, don't worry about going out and investing the difference. We'll just do it for you with one product. You can get your term and you can get your basket of mutual funds all in one and it's all tax free, imagine that. So we did those and then 2008 came around and oh my goodness gracious, did those puppies blow up in our face. No problem, the industry had a solution. Indexed, universal life. Tom, take it from there. Yeah, that's a great that's a great history. I mean, I, it, it, it really what happened in the 80s was the way whole life performs is because it's a giant bond. Like I, I talked about it earlier because it's essentially backed by a, a mutual company that's investing in long term corporate bonds. What you're going to get is kind of a rolling average of the interest rate environment over a long period of time. That's what the dividend crediting rate is. So that's exactly what happened in the 80s is you were getting credited dividend interest rates you know, in the early 1980s of nine and 10% while well, you could get 12 to 15% in money markets. So, you know, that's, so they created these policies where you could illustrate, you know, these much higher rates. And then as rates came down and whole life looked better, they said, well, wait a minute, let's look, let's look at VUL, you know, the, the, when the market of the nineties was doing great. And then when we had two crashes, two massive crashes in a row in the early 2000s, 2008, you know, that's when IUL came into place. And IUL, the promise is upside potential with downside protection. They're going to guarantee that you get no, no less than zero credited per year. Don't, don't forget that's per year. That's not, you're, you're not going to, you're not guaranteed that that policy survives. You're just guaranteed 0% crediting with an upside cap of at this point, maybe nine or 10%. But it's been high as high as 13 or 14 percent. The problem with that is you're not really guaranteed anything over a long period of time. And if you get a couple of years of zeros in a row, that may feel really good to you because, you know, you got credited zero while the market went below that. But you didn't really get a zero. You got a zero before the mortality and expenses come out. So you actually are at a negative. And when you think about the math we talked about before, now you have to catch up because the illustration said you were going to get six or seven percent every single year for forever. That's what those illustrations do is just show a static return. But you can't mathematically. You can't because of the cap, the cap of that ten percent or whatever, whatever it is at the time. By the way, that cap, the insurance company has complete control over what over what that is on an annual basis. There was policies that were illustrated with twelve and thirteen percent caps, you know, ten years ago, that are now getting eight percent as a cap because the insurance company just can change their mind at any time. That's that's really why I lean toward whole life insurance. Whole life insurance, everything's guaranteed. The premiums guaranteed, the cash value is guaranteed, the death benefits guaranteed. And the dividends are not, but they've been paid since Civil War times and they're coming. They're, the real question is at what rate? But even if they don't, even in the worst case scenario that they don't, everything is guaranteed. The insurance company can't change their mind and come back and ask you for more money. So for me, that's why it gives it a better risk adjusted return. It gives you it gives you a better bond, if you will, if you think about it as, as a bond alternative or a cash alternative or, or money market, something like that. Whereas a VUL, IUL, 
you're investing in the same stuff you can do elsewhere, but with none of those protections and guarantees. You said something in there that I just, I can almost tell you that no one is ever told. And that is that the cap is in complete control of the insurance company, that they can adjust it. I have gotten in arguments with agents and, and I know you work with 99% of the best agents. So you don't hear all this stuff. I seem to attract the 1% of the scumbags that risky drivers out there that are slinging these whole, these IULs around in all the wrong ways. But I have little, I said this on, on what we did a debate, me and Hannah with this terrible IUL guy. And he told me the cap can't be changed. Did it, he, he was talking about an uncapped one. He said that that can't be changed. It's uncapped. It's, it's what it's going to be. It's not going to change. And I said, no, like it's, it's in the contract. Like they can change this. So he argued with me. And I love that you just to talked about that. So folks, when, when they say it's got a cap, like a 10, like a cap of 10, which means that's the most participation they'll allow. Don't think that that's what's going to happen. They, they can reduce that. The illustrations, you know, Chris Kirkpatrick, and you heard him speak at the event, but me and Chris put a challenge out. And I think you might've heard it at that event. We got 10 grand on the line right now, 10 grand that we will give any IUL agent, if they can show us an illustration older than, what is it, five years? I think five years old that beats the, the illustration. And we thought that this would be, we'd be just giving money away. Like, hey, there's great marketing expense. Hey, we'll give 10 grand because, hey, the last 10 years has been one of the longest bull runs in history. So if these things perform so well in, an, in a bull market and you're, you're getting these great participation rates to the index, I mean, for crying out loud, someone has to have an illustration that beats, you know, the, or the, the, that someone has to have one that beats the illustration that they did. Not one person has shown us an illustration yet. And there's 10 grand on the line. So, I mean, like, how can that be? Like, I even struggle with that because if we just, we just went through the longest bull run in history. I mean, there were some really good years in the market. And if the indexes, if this is tied to the indexes and, you know, cap, uncap, whatever you want to call it, like whatever, we should have gotten some good returns. So if they're illustrating six, seven, maybe even some of these are 8% illustrations. I mean, how can it be that not one of them has beat the illustration that they showed? And how can that even be legal? It's because of leverage. The illustrations that you typically see, there's multipliers in there. So they'll call them participation rates, which means if you get credited, you know, 8% in a given year, they'll multiply it by 50%. So it actually gets credited 12%. And they'll illustrate that. They'll illustrate that happening every single year at, at whatever conservative rate they have, which is like 6 or 7%. You mentioned uncapped. So that person may not have been wrong that it is uncapped, but for it to be uncapped, they are paying massive fees inside the contract. So in those kind of contracts that I've seen, at least, I, there's, it's such a diverse you know, set of product. I can't, I can't make a blanket statement about the industry. But typically, if you've got a benefit in any life insurance contract, you're paying for it somewhere. So if you truly have uncapped upside, well, guess what? You're probably paying more for it. And in those years where you get zero, it's even more or less than zero after those typical mortality and expense charges come out because you're paying additional fees for that uncapped. And that's the issue. That's always the issue in these, in, in these IULs is you get a zero. It's actually less than zero. And now how do you catch up? because those internal mortality charges are higher than they were supposed to be. And God forbid you get two zeros in a row or three, like you would have in 2000 to 2002, three zeros in a row. You mathematically will never catch up. You know, in order for that policy to survive, you got to add, you got to add more capital of your own, which was not the promise that was made up front. Well, the and other thing, so just, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say the other thing that's rarely ever talked about is how the cost of insurance continues to go up the older you get. And, you know, if you're looking at it as a life insurance benefit, which really at the end of the day, all of these, whether it's a specially designed whole life or an IUL, the death benefit is really why we're buying these products is to protect our family. And, and as you get older, 60s, 70s, 80s, when you're really starting to think, hey, I'm glad I got that life insurance policy, your IUL cost of insurance will be up, well, will be at one of the highest points in the contract just by the sheer nature. So if the returns don't do what they're illustrating, that's that policy is in the exact same trouble. All those target life universal policies that I was going out and seeing are going to be in. I mean, like there was huge lawsuits back then. I remember it. I was at a major mutual and they even they had lawsuits about those target life universal, those target universal life policies. How are they, how is the industry even going to, or the IUL industry even going to be able to absorb that kind of a fallout when it does happen? I mean, do, do you think they think about this? I know the regulators look at it because there's been numerous regs against IULs, 
Like, what's your take on the long-term ramifications of this? I, I feel like this is terrible, terribly dangerous for the entire industry. It's hard to say. I mean, there's no, there's no question there's going to be a lot of unhappy people down the road. I mean, if you look at a life insurance illustration, as you know, many of them are 40 and 50 pages long, full of disclaimers and, ex and explanations. And, and I think, you know, that, that's, that's how they insulate themselves from some of those lawsuits. You know, I said this earlier to you, I th the way I look at IUL is not to vilify it. You know, I have, I have my opinions about what I would do with my own money. But the thing is, like, with, with, if you have a young investor and they want pedal to the metal risk, like they're just not going to do whole life. There's nothing inherently wrong with a well-monitored and designed VUL if you must do that, because at least you get 40% upside when the market goes up by 40%. And you know, if, if, if the market does what it, does, it did historically, you will perform as long as you funded it properly and, and monitor it. Like I still wouldn't do it, but that can work. With an IUL, it's, it's, it's beyond the scope of today's discussion, but if you understand how they actually price this stuff, like they basically take what they're earning in their general investment account, and that provides an options budget that they can go out and buy call options on the market. And over long periods of time, what that tells you, if you understand buying a call option spread to do that, is you're effectively only going to get what, you, what you're going to get in whole life anyway. Like the, your upside potential in an IUL is maybe fractionally higher than what you're probably going to get in whole life anyway. But all of the risk is on you. All of the downside is on you. You could lose hundreds of thousands of dollars of premiums that you've paid in over time, if not more. Whereas whole life maybe didn't perform quite as well, but everything is there, had all the upside. And frankly, I think in a rising interest rate environment like we're in today, or even, even you know, low for long, whole life insurance has a huge tailwind right now for, for potential growth moving forward. And whole life is really the only product that has true downside protection, meaning your cash values must grow and true upside potential where there's an uncapped dividend interest rate that can be available to you. You know, these companies were paying 13, 14% dividend interest rates in the early 80s when rate environments were that high. So it's hard to think about that now. We've, we haven't seen that in decades, but you will participate in all of that with whole life, but with no risk. The company's taking it all off the table. I mean, come on. I, when I hear you speak and I hear everybody else speak that knows how these vehicles work, I think about like, how is it that anyone would ever buy one of these products and, and how is it that like they don't catch i don't know it just it upsets me but you know what i if you watch politics and you watch the news right now you probably got the same kind of feeling you know it probably pisses you off there too well real quick i want to hit one other thing that pissed a lot of people off the new york times 1973 we found it. So remember, we were asking who that guy was. It wasn't the Pinto. It was the Corvair. And it was Mr. Ralph Nader. Insurance called consumer fraud. It just, it's funny to look back in time. But right here, February 23rd, 73, consumer advocates a charge testimony. Anyway, I'm not going to read it all. But basically, they're just saying the life insurance industry is taking advantage of people putting them into policies. Now, bear in mind, these are whole life policies that the public cannot understand with pricing systems, which prevents intelligent shopping. And the, the reason they said this, and I, I've read a lot about this, but they, they, in a whole life, you can't really dissect the cost of insurance from, it's kind of just, picture a, a, a milkshake, right? Like a milkshake, you just drink it and you're like, oh, that's good. But you, you rarely think about like, how many ingredients did they put in here? How was that ice cream made? Like, I wonder who made that. I wonder if, you know, they washed their hands before they did it. It's, it's kind of like that. So what they did is they did this whole thing. And Ralph Nader was absolutely behind this, where they gave whole life kind of a black eye and opened the door to a more transparent life insurance policy, which was the universal life, because interest rates were high back then. So it was easy to to drive that. But you know, the one thing I, I wanted to bring this up, because some of you are probably thinking, why the heck is this even relevant for today's discussion? It's relevant because we have short-term memory problems. We only remember what happened yesterday, and we forget what's happened in the past. Folks, this same thing right here that happened back then could happen again. And, and the thing that you got to really understand is, you know, like when this stuff happens, like it affects everything. It affected a whole lot of people with those universal life policies, but they had such short-term memories or whatever you want to call it because they were in a high interest rate environment. They just thought that that gravy train was never going to end. And the reason I, I bring that up is right now, folks, a lot of people have been dealing with just an unbelievable tailwind behind their investments, behind their stocks, behind anything you put your money into. You feel like it could just never go down from real estate to, to stocks, to mutual funds, to ETFs. Some might even say crypto, but listen, folks, 
What goes up must come down. Just can't tell you when it's going to happen. Can't tell you how it's going to happen. Can't tell you how bad it's going to be. Just the whole point of everything Tom just explained to you is risk mitigation, is trying to get you to understand the risks and how to eliminate as many of them as possible. I don't care if it's from your retirement. I don't I, whatever you know in any of these discussions, but just logically think about things and you'll understand. I mean. When I read this New York Times and bits and pieces of it, it just makes me sick. Knowing what I know now and knowing where we're at, going back, thinking, holy crap, this guy literally was trying to dismantle the entire whole life industry because he said it wasn't transparent. And then he came up with a transparent product that blew up in most people's faces. Oh, yes. And then there was the Corvair. I don't know really what to say about it. It was a pretty badass car. But yeah, God forbid you get hit. That was a bad problem. So, Tom, as we kind of wrap you know, this wealth webinar, this has been good. Is there any final things that you, you know, like any things that we didn't hit on that you think would be relevant for this audience? We hit on a lot. That's hard. That's a hard question to answer. I can't believe you gave think... us an hour and a half. I, I remember asking, I'm like, so what do you got? 30 minutes? And you're like, nope, I blocked off an hour and a half. So folks, I want everybody to put their hands to get the, the Pinto, whatever the Corvair was. Corvair is a badass car. You're right. It was the Pinto in the back. But Real quick, I want everybody to put their hands together and just put thank you in the chat. But I also want all of you to go to permission to spend.com. That's the right one, right, Tom? You can go right on Amazon. Permission to spend's on Amazon. I think someone shared a link earlier. So appreciate that, whoever did that. If you could go on and get the audio book or get the paper book, the paperback book, whatever you want to get, just get the book. I mean, he just literally brought some serious value here. I mean, come on, the guy's got a PhD. I, I don't got one of those and I don't want one of those. It's just... And that's just one of those things that's not on my bucket list there. Sorry. But, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and the other thing, too, I don't know, is there any any of you advisors or agents on here? If you're an advisor or agent, just put I in the chat real quick. And there's the link for that uh, book. One thing Tom also does is he coaches advisors. He's got like a, a training he does bi-weekly. There's well over a hundred advisors and agents on there. And he brings like the top 1% of uh, advisors, the top producers on. They share like language. They talk about the just the concepts that they're doing. T Tom, what else do you guys talk about on there? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm on, I'm on an airplane every week. I'm on 30 to 50 stages a year, you know, giving my keynote to rooms full of advisors. And and on top of that, I, I invite them into my ongoing program that I call Whole Life Mastermind. So if there's anyone on the call who is an advisor and is in this space, you certainly get a lot out of it. I invite those thought leaders. Like we talked about Wade Fow, you know, thought leaders like that. I have, you know, the top advisors from throughout the industry, not just any company. And the whole idea is to carry, carry the torch. You know, I see myself as a person who carries the torch for this portion of the industry, which is which was founded on protection, guarantees, liquidity, safety, shifting of risk, which is really where the financial planning world was born. People that just gather assets and roll investments into 401k plans or IRAs, like they're not actually financial planners. They're investment managers. They may be great people and they may be doing a good, good job with that account, but that's not really full financial planning. And that's that's the mission that I'm on is to, to keep this industry honest and and give people the resources to to do that for their clients and not just get seduced by the fun conversations or the easy sales. All right. So folks, with that being said, we're going to wrap this wealth webinar. Tom, thank you so very much. Again, all of you, Permission to Spend is the name of the book. Grab a copy of it, get the audio book. And if you're an advisor, go out there and check out Whole Life Masterminds and get around that campfire because that'd be a good one. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them, but I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.